Kings chapter 5, 1 to 19. King, 2 Kings chapter 5, 1 to 19. I will be reading from the ESV version, so just uh, look along as I read. 2 Kings chapter 5, 1 to 19. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor. Because of him, the Lord has given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians of, on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that, my lord, were the prophet who is, a Samaria, who is in Samaria? He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me now, and he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a message to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and ye shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place and kill the leper. Are not Abana and Papa the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage, in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and, his, and all his company, and he came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So accept now a present from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged, to take him, to, urged him to take it, but he refused. Then Naaman said, If not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth, for from now on your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any god but the Lord. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. When the master goes into the house of Rimon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Rimon. And when I bow myself in the house of Rimon, the Lord pardon your servant in this manner. He said to him, Go in peace. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, Well, thanks for reading that story. It's a little long, but I'm sure that you all enjoyed reading the story. I'm sure you've also read it before, but it's uh, a reminder to, um, to us about what's happened with Naaman, and which we'll have a look at it um, um, tonight. Now, last week we looked at a character called Rahab. Rahab right? So we learned about evangelism and that Rahab was hearing about the stories of God, and then um, she finally repented and believed in God. And amazingly, her name appears in the New Testament. It's in Hebrews chapter 11, and also her name is in Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel in Jesus' genealogy. So she becomes like great-great-grandfather of David, the King David. So uh, an amazing story from harlot to a kind of you know, um, heroine, um, a female hero, 
uh, in the faith. Now, continuing on that series, we come to this man called Naaman. Now, you'll notice that already uh, both Rahab and Naaman, in fact, um, there are multiple others as well. Now, these are Gentiles. Gentiles come in to uh, the family of God. They became believers, and in fact, um, they're saved. They're in the kingdom of heaven, and for someone like Rahab, she comes into the family tree of Jesus Christ. And this tells us that the grace of God is um, extending to the Gentiles. And that's not strange for us, is it? Because God promised to Abraham right from the beginning that you will be the root of blessing for all the families of the earth. Not just for Jews, but for all the families of the earth. So simply, God is doing that and honoring that, that promise, that covenant, even in the Old Testament times. So these selected Gentiles have the favor of God and they receive God's grace and they become believers in the Old Testament um, and they basically are saved. And Naaman is one such person. So let's look at the story of Naaman and how he actually um, comes to that faith. Now the time is about 850 BC. This is about 70 years or so after the split of the two kingdoms. You know, um, David united the kingdom of Israel, and then Solomon also enjoyed that unified kingdom, a lot of money, wealth, and prosperity, power. But after Solomon died, the kingdom became split into two. North becomes which one? North Israel. Ten tribes. South, Judah, uh, Judah and Benjamin, so the two tribes, so ten, two, uh, two split kingdoms. And then from there, they have kings. But you notice that um, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, becomes the king of southern Judah. The northern Israel is, um, in fact, um, it's not continuing with the royal line. Um, uh, Jeroboam, a general, becomes the king, and then after that, uh, multiple other kings come, but you can see that northern Israel is not according to that royal um, lineage, only the southern Judah. So about 70 years have um, passed, and we know that you know, in the future, um, not from our time, but you know, from that time, the, both kingdoms will be destroyed, um, north Israel by Assyria and southern Judah by Babylon, and that's their history. So this is about, in between that, about 850 B.C., about 70 years after the split of the kingdoms, um, and this is a time when northern Israel had a king called King Joram, or Jehoram, and you'll, you'll find that um, in our story. So that's about the time. And also, um, during the time, you have to understand that when the kingdoms split, before that, the unified kingdom was very strong. So all the surrounding nations were basically serving Israel. But when the kingdom split, the other nations took advantage of that and they became stronger and some of them were actually invading Israel and Judah. In fact, God was using them to punish Israel and Judah when they disobeyed God. So even these Gentile nations are used as instruments of God and we'll see that also uh, in this story as well. So that's the kind of um, context. And um, especially this concerns two kingdoms, Syria, Syria is different from Assyria. Assyria is different um, uh, kingdom, and Syria is yet another kingdom. Um, and Syria and Israel. And Syria and Israel are not really on friendly terms um, with each other. They kind of are enemies, and there's a great tension between the two kingdoms, and you can see that um, playing out in this story as well. So look at verse 1, chapter 5. Now, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. Now this is the introduction of the man Naaman. He was a noble man. Now whether he was a Jew or Gentile, it's really irrelevant. He, he was a reputable man. He was a good man, basically. He was a faithful soldier or a general, especially to his king. And it says that the Lord God had given victory to Syria by him. So God used Naaman even before he was converted. He became a believer. God used him to 
um, destroy other nations like Assyria. Um, Syria had victory over Assyria as well, and Syria became a, a very strong power in that region. And along with that, um, Syria also sometimes raided Israel in verse 2. The Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. So you can see that they're going around raids and basically plundering, stealing from their enemies, in this case Israel and Assyria, um, and in particular, in this particular case, they actually brought a girl from Israel as a slave girl, which was pretty normal for the soldiers to do at the time. The first thing that you need to notice here is that um, Naaman, the main character, is of Syria. And Syria is an enemy of Israel. It's like the enemy nation of, of God's chosen people. And that means Naaman is the general of the enemy nation to Israel. Even they go on raids and they steal from Israel. The relationship between Israel and Syria are enmity with each other. There's a tension between the two kingdoms. That's not very favorable. And now God was using Naaman to give Syria victory. Now that tells us about something about Israel. God is not fighting for Israel in this case. God is fighting with the Syrians against Israel. And that tells us that Israel was in disobedience, and that was the case. In fact, all the kings of northern Israel were bad kings, evil kings. And time and time again, they are under the punishment of God as God used these nations to invade and to punish Israel. So that, that's the situation. So Naaman kind of stands on the Syrian side, which is the enemy of Israel. Um, even though God was using them, they were, using, they were being used by God temporarily, but still they are uh, at enmity against Israel. And that tells us something about us as well. Now, just as Naaman was an enemy of God's nation, we were also enemies of God. We read from Romans chapter 5, our responsorial reading. It says very clearly that while we were still enemies of God. You might just read through that very quickly without really thinking much, but... If you think about the meaning of every word, it is quite a loaded verse. Let me find that verse and, and read it to you. It's in Romans chapter 10, for your reference, verse, chapter 5, verse 10. It says, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Now, this if is not conditional if. It simply means that if this is the case, so when we were enemies of God, if Jesus Christ came and died to reconcile us to him, then the next phrase comes. So when we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God. Have you ever thought that, that you are an enemy of God? That we were at enmity with God? That's not something that people think about, especially Christians don't tend to think about that, but we were. I guess the trouble is sometimes Christians act like enemies of God. They may not be, if they are saved, they are Christians, and they are reconciled to God, but they act like unbelievers and therefore enemies of God. And that's not consistent with what we say and what we believe. And that, that's you know, something else that we can talk at another time. But before we became Christians, before we were saved, we were enemies of God. And it's as if that God came into the enemy territory and rescued us through rescue mission, and that is to send Jesus Christ and die on the cross for our sins and saving us from our sin and judgment. Just as Naaman was an enemy of God's nation, every person comes to this world as an enemy of God, and God has to reconcile him or her through salvation. In a sense, this also tells us this. Yes, Naaman was an enemy of God's nation, but nonetheless God is using him and giving him some victory. And also he's showing a tremendous grace to this Gentile general. Even an enemy of God is shown mercy of God. And that's the gospel. Yes, we were enemies of God. God showed us his mercy and grace, and that's how we were saved. 
It's like Naaman, who was a Gentile, an enemy of God, shown mercy and get healed by God's prophet. So that's the first thing that we notice about this story. An enemy reconciled, enemy shown God's mercy, and that's our story as well. The second, let's have a look at the man, Naaman. The name, name actually, Naaman actually means gracious. It means fair or pleasant. It's a very nice name. It's a wonderful name. And quite fittingly, his character is quite noble. He was a mighty man of valor, which means that he was a warrior. Uh, he was skilled at battles and warfare. But also, he was a faithful man. He says here, he was an honorable man, a great honorable man in the eyes of his master. You can imagine Naaman being a very established leader and with, with respect and honor. It's, it's, he's like a statesman. He's like a general. Uh, he's a very high-ranking government official who has already earned some reputation even from the king. Now, he's a kind of man that you want to be friends with. He's a faithful man. He's the kind of man that you can depend on. Just as the name suggests, he's also gracious, fair, and pleasing man. He was successful. Humanly speaking, he was really going well. His life was at its peak. The Lord was actually on his side and giving him victory. He was respected, most likely pretty wealthy as well. The only one flaw with him was that he was a leper. Leper. Some kind of skin disease and that couldn't be healed. And that was a big blemish for him. And perhaps because of that, that sort of limited his um, influence or sphere of um, his um, you know, career as well. It was one thing that he wanted to fix, but he couldn't because it was incurable disease at the time. This is also a picture of everyone. You may be successful, you may be wealthy, you may be respected, you may have won favor with people, but we all have this disease called sin, just like leprosy. It's a picture of every person who comes to this world as a sinner. Despite success and prominence, that sin doesn't go away. You cannot heal yourself. The problem of sin, the problem of leprosy, stays with people, stays with <coughs> Naaman. So Naaman is a kind of symbol of every sinner. A successful he or she may be, but still nonetheless a leper, filthy leper, filthy sinner before God. So take note of that. He was an enemy, but God showed him mercy. He was a leper. That's a picture of every person who comes as a sinner. But look at verse 2 and 3. There's a little turn of events here. When the Syrians had gone out on raids, he says, um, they had brought back a captive, a young girl from the land of Israel. And she waited on Naaman's wife. She was given as a slave or a maid to Naaman's wife. This is a young Israelite girl. Now she is a kind of nameless, unnoticed hero or, or hero heroine in this story. One of two, in fact. And look at how she conducts herself. Now just imagine this. This is a young girl, probably in her teenage years, maybe even younger than um, you know, all the teenagers. And yet, um, you know, she's showing some kind of kindness. And that's not easy. It might have taken some time, but she's taken as captive. It, it's possible that her parents might have been killed. She's separated from her uh, relatives, siblings, and friends from her hometown, she's plucked out of a familiar homeland and, he, and she's brought into a foreign country as a slave. And that's a very vulnerable position. It's not a nice you know, migration or getting a job and living in someone's house as a maid. This is a slave, captured slave, without any human rights. But of course it was a blessing for her to 
stay in Naaman's house because Naaman was a reputable man. He was an honorable man. I'm sure that he treated her with some dignity. And because of that, perhaps, she showed some kindness, even to an enemy. I suppose by this time, um, this girl and Naaman and Naaman's wife had some kind of um, good-willed relationship. So she says to her mistress in verse 3, If only my master were with the prophet, my master meaning Naaman, prophet who lives in, in Samaria, then he would heal him of his leprosy. So she tells him uh, the story of uh, this prophet, prophet called Elisha. In chapter 4, Elisha had done about five miracles, amazing miracles by the power of God. In fact, he surpassed the miracles and powers of his own master, Elijah. He did more miracles than Elisha, double the portion. So his fame went throughout the land of Israel and even to some foreign countries. And she, of course, knows about him. And she tells Naaman's wife, if our master were with him, then he could heal him. He's in Samaria. Notice also, this is another note. Look, this, um, this, um, um, this is between Naaman's wife and this young girl, nameless girl. This girl tells Naaman's wife because um, she's serving her. And Naaman's wife must also have been uh, a good wife. She's, it looks like we get a feeling that she is treating her slave girl, maid, this young girl, with some dignity as well, treating well. And um, Naaman's wife is caring and concerned for her husband. And she doesn't just write off this slave girl's comment. She takes it seriously and she goes and tells her husband. She's a caring and good wife, just like Naaman. It's the whole household, isn't it? I think that must have been a really wonderful household to work in. Yes, it was an enemy's um, household, but still he was a good man, a good household. Now look at verse 4. So this is what happens. And Naaman went in and told his master, the king, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Let's just pause and think about this situation. Of course, uh, the Bible gives us a story in kind of cryptic way. This is obviously a story that took place over some time. And we are given a summary of that. Uh, so we kind of bypassed a lot of events and time as well. But still, um, we can imagine what must have happened. Now, Naaman is an honorable, reputable man. Not a believer. If anything, they had some idol worship. Idols who were really nothing, who couldn't do anything. But now she listens, the, the wife listens to um, the girl's comment. There's a prophet who can heal Naaman. And Naaman listens to her. And Naaman seems to believe that. And he actually goes to the king. For Naaman to do that, it must have... Um, taken Naaman by, by um, some great some, some, um, credibility because he is a man of um, high caliber. Now, he's not the kind of person who just go and tell the king about something that this nobody has told him. Now, there are some things um, at play here. Naaman's leper. So he's desperate. I suppose you can say that he has nothing to lose. But at the same time, he has a character. And his character seems to be that, that he was pretty humble, humble enough to listen to even the enemy's slave girl. She, she's just a little girl taken from an enemy's country. I mean, how could you trust this, this little girl? And we, as we read the story, Naaman actually goes to Israel, to Samaria, to the enemy's king. In a way, he's risking his life. All because of this little girl's comment. But still, it seems that they have some sort of trust. Naaman was a man of character. He was humble, humble enough to listen to this young girl. In fact, later on, he listens to his servants as well. He's a general, but he has ears to hear. He has listening ears. And that's important leadership quality, isn't it? Whether it's back then or now, leaders must be able to listen to 
the people whom he or she serves. You can't simply lead without listening to the people who you are leading. He listens to the girl, goes to the king and tells the story because he, he trusts the girl and also he has um, a humble heart and, and he wants to be healed, basically. He wants the permission from the king. And he must have been pretty convincing. Um, the king actually says, go, go now. Sure, go and, um, go and um, meet with the king. I'll write a letter to the king of Israel. So that's how the story unfolds. Now let's stop and maybe think about um, evangelism as well, evangelism. Can you find any wisdom of evangelism here, up to here? Now evangelism is simply to, to tell the good news. To tell the good news of salvation, yes. To tell the good news of God, in this case, to tell the good news of healing. Who is evangelizing or who is preaching? It's the little girl. Naaman is on the receiving end. This little girl is nameless, powerless, no status. She's a slave, a captive from enemy country, just serving as a maid, Naaman's wife. And yet, she has certain influence, <laughs> reputation, to sound convincing to the wife and to Naaman. I think this girl must have conducted herself in a really worthy way, a really trustworthy girl who was faithful, good, just like Joseph of um, the story in Genesis. She even won the heart of the mistress and the master. What an amazing, amazing girl. She, she is the hero here. And how does she approach evangelism? She sees the problem, master's leprosy. You can sense in what she says here in verse 3 that she has sympathy for him. She's also very caring. She has compassion. She wants her master, Naaman, even if he was the enemy of Israel, she, she wants him to be healed. Because she saw, um, at least Naaman was a reputable man, but still, um, you know, she, she knew that God also loved him, that God also extends grace to Gentiles. So she tells Naaman's wife and Naaman, in turn, effectively, you can go to the prophet in Samaria and you might be healed. In fact, I mean, she doesn't just tell straight away, go to Samaria. She says, if only my master were with the prophet. So she's kind of throwing the possibility. You see the wisdom there? This is, this is really wonderful. She sees the problem, and she doesn't just um, give the solution or give the command. She's throwing, in a very discreet way, in a caring way, a possibility of the solution to the problem. If only my master were in Samaria, this prophet could heal him. Of course, she tells him uh, and her, the, the wife and, and Naaman, uh, about what God could do through the prophet. And that's given. She knew it. Elisha has just done some amazing miracles, and she knows about that. So she has no doubt that God, through this prophet, can do such things like curing and healing Naaman of leprosy. So that's clear. And she kind of floats the idea. You know, what if? What if you go and see him? He can heal you. So she has really amazing wisdom. She, she's telling the truth in a way that they cannot really refuse. You know, they take it in, they think about it, and they make decision, and they actually translate that into action. They go... Naaman goes to the king and says, I want to go. She's simply doing this. She's telling them the power of God. She's telling them the power of God. It's just like Rahab. 
Rahab has been hearing about the power of God, God's miracles, and defeating all the, the enemies of Israel. Now here, this little girl is telling Naaman's wife and Naaman the power of God to heal. When there is a need especially, God can give you healing. We can get some wisdom here for your, our evangelism. In our situation, it may be sickness like Naaman, or it may be some family problems. It could be some sort of relationship tension or relationship problem with your friends. It may be even impending death, some sort of terminal illness. If you look around the people, they all have problems. Do you, do you notice that? Everybody has problems. They may not tell you everything, but they all have problems. Now, we also have problems, but you know, as Christians, we know that um, you know, we can be content through God and His grace and His solutions. But if you look around, people have all kinds of problems. And, and unbelievers have foundational problems. And that is death. Disease and death like leprosy, incurable disease. Judgment of God. Hell. Because of that, there are many other problems. And if you look at them and their problems, you will see that oh, only if they bring that matter to God or to church or to someone, a faithful Christian, then perhaps God could use those people, God could use the church to help them in some way. Of course, I'm not uh, saying that you can come to church to get healed and to get money and fix for you all the problems. I'm, I'm not saying that God simply um, solves your problems, um, material problems and earthly problems. But we know as Christians that foundationally when you come and believe in God and when you become Christians, you know that, that we have a kind of you know, big puzzle solved. We know that our sins are all forgiven. We know that we are all going to heaven. And we know what guidelines by which we must live our lives. And we know that God is in control of all things. He is sovereign Lord over our lives. And we ought to do our best to honor him, to respect him, to serve him. We have all these answers, truths, but unbelievers don't. So when you look at them and their problems, you wish only if, only if, you could come to the Lord God. He could give you healing. When you see that, do what this little girl did. Go and tell them. Tell them. Point out their problems, kind of subtly, but in a compassionate way, not in a judgmental way, obviously. Tell them, now you've got the problem, but have you, have you heard about the Bible? Uh, has it occurred to you that the Bible talks about that very problem? Relationship problems? Family issues? Work problems? Your sickness? Disease? About your eternal soul? The need for your soul? Now you, 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 you know that people cannot be satisfied ever but do you know that the Bible talks about satisfaction, eternal contentment? Only if you could come and read the Bible with me. You can use your wisdom to tell them that. You may not have to you know, directly tell them, do this and do that, but just float the idea. Give them some hope. The possibility of solutions to all these issues and problems. Just like this little girl. If you do it, especially with good relationship, some trust, and some credibility, just like this young girl did with Naaman's wife and Naaman, then they will listen to you. Of course, God has to work in their hearts as well. You pray that God will do that, and with God's working in their hearts, they will be moving. Now, can you see that, um, you know, we talked about Rahab's turning, right? Rahab's turning, she was hearing the stories of God, she was um, turning, and her heart was turning and turning. And when Israel, Israel came to Jericho and they, and they knew that they were going to be destroyed by Israel, 
Rav said, um, I, I know that the Lord God has given you this city. And the two spies came into her house. She knew that that was her chance. She knew that she couldn't miss that opportunity. So she hid the spies. And afterwards, she came to the spies and said, Therefore, I beg you, I beg you to spare my house. She knew that that was the opportunity for her. Second chance may not come. That was the trigger. That was her catalytic moment. The catalyst was the two spies. That's when she took the leap of faith and she went past the point of no return. There is no hesitation whatsoever in Rahab's story because she's already made up her mind and she's now put that into action by hiding the spies. Her heart has turned to God. Repentance. What about Naaman? As the little girl kind of floated the idea, the process has begun. Now she is a kind of a, a starter. She is the starter of this process of turning the heart. Now someone has to start. It might be you, to people around you. Now you'll be quite surprised to, to find out that you know, those people around you who are not Christians, those who are not believers, they may have never heard of any uh, proper evangelism or proper words of persuasion. You know, you've, you've got to study the Bible. Why don't you read the Bible with me? Would you like to do that? You know, many of them have never had anyone come and say that to them. You'll be surprised. You think that they know about Christianity. You think that they know about church. You think that they probably had a chance to come to church. Maybe not. Maybe yes, but maybe not. It may be that you're the first one. Perhaps they are waiting for you to tell that to them. Of course, they may not say that, but they're kind of hoping their soul is yearning. You know, he says he's a Christian. She says she's a Christian. When is he going to tell me about the Bible? I wish that she would told me she would tell me about the peace that she has because she is a Christian. She seems to have some kind of peace and um, really uh, wonderful contentment in her, with her, hope in her. And when you come, when people come to you and ask for the reason for the hope that is in you, you must be ready to give a defense and answer to them. Second Peter chapter three, verse sixteen. And in Naaman's case, this little girl started the process. Perhaps you can say that she started the process long before she told him this, because she had already been conducting herself in a very worthy manner. She was earning trust. And they listened to her when she told them about this prophet in, in Samaria. So in verse 5, then the king said, King of Syria, Syria said, Go now, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. Now you know that the, the relationship was not really good. In a sense, uh, well, in a way, Syria was more powerful than Israel at this time. So Syria's king kind of acts like a more powerful king. Okay, I will write a letter of recommendation to the king of Israel. So take this letter and go to him. You know, he will listen to me. He will honor my letter. <laughs> of course, that's what he thinks. It doesn't happen that way, but... He says that and then he sends him away. So he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver, about 350 kilograms of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, about 70 kilograms of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. Clothing were very expensive and uh, precious commodity at the time. So 10 changes of clothing. I'm sure it was very nice ones. Uh, they were very nice ones. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said... Now be advised. Can you see the tone there? Uh, kind of, I'm saying, you listen to me. When this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. Now, for some reason, Naaman went to the king, not to the prophet. It would have been wonderful if he went to the prophet directly, and that would have been all right. But he went to the king, you know, perhaps because um, they thought, uh, the king would know about the prophet, at least um, to show some kind of respect to the king, um, to the kingdom. He goes to the king, the, the head of the state. 
But this is how the king, King Joram or Jehoram, received this letter. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes. Tearing clothes is an expression of uh, sometimes anger, remorse, uh, regret, sadness. So all of that. He really doesn't know what to do. He's kind of, um, he felt, he felt um, threatened, but also he felt very angry. He said, am I God to kill and make alive? That this man sends a man to be healed to, be, to me to be to heal him of his leprosy. Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. Now he thinks that the Syrian king is trying to start a fight. He's picking a fight. He thinks this is an excuse to start a battle to destroy Israel. Or so that's what he thought. So he's pretty upset, very upset. And then Elisha hears about this. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Why get upset? Please let him come to me. Because I'm the prophet. And, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman goes to Elisha. Verse 9. He went with his horses and chariot meaning that he's going with all the pomp. He's going as a general, all the procession, all the soldiers and horses and chariot. Um, we get a sense that Naaman, yes, he was an honorable man, reputable man, but also he's a man of valor, a warrior. Um, he is quite proud of his position as well. He wants to kind of you know, show off I mean, in a way. I mean, every man in that kind of position has the kind of um, tendency to show off and to be respected. He goes to the king and deals with the king. And then he goes to the prophet with all these chariots and horses. And he stands at the door of Elisha's house in Samaria. And Elisha, verse 10, look at this. Elisha sent a messenger. He doesn't come out himself. He sent a messenger. No, did you notice that he sent a messenger to the king of Israel as well? Now this is a time when you can say that the prophets... The true prophets of God were above kings, evil kings, you know, bad kings. The prophets were telling the people of Israel the word of God. So they, they are more prominent, they are more important in a sense. So this Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. That's it. Just go and wash seven times. It's a very dry reception, unkind, sort of uh, very um, careless. He's not getting due attention that he thought that he would get from the prophet, but rather just an instruction, go and wash seven times in the river Jordan. So how does he respond in verse 11? Naaman became furious, angry, furious. And he says he went away. Hopefully not very far, but he went away. He turned around and he just went. He was angry. At least um, he wasn't um, rude enough to kill or destroy Elijah. Others might have done that. But he just became angry and said, what is this prophet saying? He went away and he said, indeed I said to myself, no, he's sort of saying, saying, telling himself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over this place and heal the leprosy. Now, I thought he was going to come, come out and do this himself. But he sends a messenger and just tells me to go and wash in the Jordan. Are not the Abna and the Papa, Fapa or Papa, the two rivers in Syria, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? We have good, clean water stream. If I could wash, then I could stay there and then wash myself there. Why would I come all the way, down, all the way to Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. He was bubbling inside, you know, angry, boiling inside. This is humiliating. Disgrace. He's a general that represents Syria. 
he's given a very bad reception by this supposedly a prophet and he's just very angry. Now one thing that um, we don't read here, um, one thing that Naaman is probably missing is, is this. If you go to the Leviticus, um, God told Moses, if you have a leper, this is what to do. To diagnose and to whether the, the person has been healed or not, you know, he, he gives a bunch of instructions. And then, once a person is healed of leprosy, then the person's supposed to go not only to the priest, but also he's supposed to go to the water and wash himself, just clean himself or herself. So cleansing or washing yourself in the river water like this was a symbol of, of healing. Israelites knew that. It looks like Naaman didn't know that. If he knew that that was a symbol of healing, perhaps he might have thought, oh, he might, he might want to heal me. That may be why he tells me to go and wash myself in the River Jordan, because that's what they did when they wanted to be healed, or when they were healed afterwards. So there's a little bit, a bit of connection there, but Naaman didn't see that as a Gentile. He probably did not know Jewish um, custom, um, so he just went away. Went away, just furious, just being very angry. He rejected this instruction. He thought, this is just tedious. You know, what, what is that? We'll, we'll go, go and wash in, in the river Jordan. It's not likely to change anything. I've, I've washed myself a number of times before. Didn't heal my leprosy. That's what he thought. So, uh, what happens after that? This is fourth point. Now, we looked at... Um, the little, little, we looked at Naaman, the man Naaman, and we looked at the little girl and how she introduced the, the possibility of getting healed, about three things there. And number four, here we have another um, important moment. Look at verse 13. When he's about to return, his servants, now these are Syrian servants, came near and spoke to him. The servants may have known the little girl. Servants seem to have some kind of faith or hope. They came and spoke to him and said, My father, this is just an um, uh, expression of extreme respect. My father, my Lord, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done? If the prophet had told you to run up and down the mountain seven times, would you not have done? If the prophet have told you to scrape off all the dirty skin despite the pain, would you not have done it? I'm sure you've done it. You would have done it. Then how much more then, when he says to you, wash and be clean? That's easy. I mean, it's not hard. You just have to go to the river Jordan and then just wash yourself seven times. Doesn't take much effort, does it? No pain, no great sacrifice or price to pay. So they persuade him. This is another, or a number of them here, another nameless hero or heroes. His servants, Syrian servants. We had a Jewish girl. We now have Gentile servants telling him, something and he listens he's a humble man he listens the servants persuaded Naaman it's not an easy thing to come to an angry furious general soldier warrior master who has every authority and power over you and say something contrary to what the master is doing Perhaps the servants knew that Naaman was an honorable man, so maybe they had some courage to come and tell him, but still, Naaman could have just said, you, you disappear from my face. He could have just um, slayed them with his sword and there would be absolutely no problem. But he listens to them. My father, if the prophet had told you. Now, can you also see the wisdom here? Now, these servants don't simply say, Still, it's nothing, it's not hard, just go and wash, wash uh, seven times. They say in a very wise way, first of all, 
very respect, respectable term, my father. Also a very endearing term as well, isn't it? To call your Lord my father. So if you are speaking with an unbeliever whom you are evangelizing, show that person that you have uttermost respect as a person. No. Understand the person's honor and dignity. Give him or her full respect. And the servants say, if the prophet had told you. Now they are appealing to Naaman's logic. Simple logic. They are reasoning with him. Can you see that? If the prophet have told you, has told you to do something greater, then would you not have done? If that's the case, then this is far easier thing to do. Why wouldn't you do this? They're making it look like um, unreasonable for Naaman to walk away. This is your opportunity, perhaps once in a lifetime opportunity to be healed of your leprosy that you've been suffering from all your life. And take that one blemish out of your life and become the great man. And now you're walking away just because you feel humiliated, you feel your pride is, is crushed. Sinful pride. So they reason with him. They persuade him to listen to them. They convince him. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, one of the things that Paul said to Timothy, as a pastor, you must convince, rebuke if necessary, persuade, so that they might listen and turn. Persuade. If you look at all the preachings of the, the, the apostles in the book of Acts, their, their preachings are always persuasive. They all have persuasive um, elements in their preaching. It is not some kind of human um, manipulation or trying to manipulate people into thinking and believing what you say. It is simply persuading them to believe in the truth. And that couldn't be that hard. After all, you're not selling something that is hoax or phony. You're telling them the truth. But sometimes we need to persuade them because they do not just listen to the truth because of their sinful bent. They may listen to their own human sinful pride more than the truth of God. So they persuaded him. And he listens. And he listens. So verse 14, so he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. So in evangelism also, use logical argument, use reasoning, appeal to human reasons. Say things like, and think about this, surely our life is not about just temporary, temporal life in this world, is it? I mean, we are not just bones and flesh and blood, are we? We have much more than that, our souls, our spirits. And there's got to be a spiritual world. Look, if there are all these things, earth, the sun and the moon, all the, the nature, trees, animals, then there must be a creator. Someone must have created them. They could not just have come into being by chance, could it? You appeal to their simple logic. You don't have to be a scientist or... Don't be afraid just because that person knows more than you in science and other things. You simply you appeal to their simple human logic. Look, there are many things that you cannot see, but they still exist. God is invisible, but he still exists. So you appeal to their human logic. You give them logical arguments. Persuade them. If you need more, read the Bible. The Bible is full of those things. You read the Bible, you learn from the Bible, you tell them the stories in the Bible. Persuade them. Sometimes rebuke them gently like these servants. Look, Master, if the, if the prophet has told you, told you to do something great, would you, not have, would you not have done it? 
And that's a kind of mild form of rebuke, isn't it? You're not doing what, what is so easy. Why not? At the same time, they're telling him that they respect him by saying, my father. So, use logical argument, but be gentle. Show respect. Show honor. And you understand that whoever that person is, that person is with you, still listening to you, because that person has not totally rejected the gospel yet. He or she is not totally against God. There is still hope if you still have opportunities to talk with that person. So in verse 14, he goes and he dipped seven times in the Jordan. This is action, right? This is action. Action caused by what's happening in his mind. Now for Naaman, this must be the catalytic moment. This is when his heart turned. He went past the point of no return. He was kind of listening to the girl, thinking maybe it's possible. Perhaps God is that powerful. Maybe I can be healed. He comes to Israel, and that's a really big step of faith. He comes to Elisha, and Elisha kind of doesn't see him and, and gives him very bad reception. And his sinful human pride comes up and almost turns him around. But then again, the servants come and tell him he listens. And then he's taking that step of faith to, to take him beyond that point of no return, the line of no return. He says, yes, I can do that. It's not hard. Yes, I'll do that. According to what the man of God had told him, he went and dipped seven times, exactly according to what he had said. And it's not really the water that cleanses him here, is it? It's his obedience. His obedience in his heart, which was demonstrated by his action of going to the river and rushing seven times. His obedience. And all this happened because of this catalytic moment. The catalyst at this time would be the servants. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Gentile servants. I'm sure that um, when Naaman believed, he wasn't the only one to believe. I'm sure he and his household all believed in God, most likely including his wife, his servants, all these people who knew about what's happened with Naaman. They all became God-fearing Gentiles. So these servants are kind of <laughs> enjoying the show, and they say something really important to turn the heart of Naaman. And then they act as catalysts. And this is the moment for Naaman. So again, pause and then think about how you can apply this in your evangelistic endeavor. Just like these servants, and just like that young girl who started the process, you can be the catalyst. Be the catalyst. You can be the starter as well if you want. You can be the starter and the catalyst. Sometimes God may use a different person as a starter and a different person as a catalyst. That's perfectly fine. But you have to start the process if you haven't started. If someone's in the kind of journey to discovering the truth in the Bible, then you can be the catalyst. Pray about that. Think about that. And do not miss that opportunity when you can be the catalyst. And God can use that as the catalytic moment for the person to believe. Believing is a kind of journey. Salvation takes place in an instant. It's not gradual. But to get to that point, it takes a kind of journey. For some people, it's a long journey. For some people, it might be a shorter journey. But nonetheless, they are all going through some kind of journey and process to believe in the gospel and to turn that final moment and to believe in God, to believe in Christ, to believe in the gospel. As they go through that process, they have that catalytic moment, the moment when faith 
becomes saving faith. I mean, we all have that. I remember that for myself as well. The moment when I understood about eternal redemption, that was the moment for me. And there were people around me who were acting as catalysts to help me to come to that stage and then to believe in the gospel. You need to look out for those opportunities. So keep telling them about God. Start the process. Be wise about this. You can say one thing in multiple different ways and find out which would be the best way to say. And when the moment comes, the crucial moment that the person can believe, but maybe that person is at that verge of either turning this way or that way, like Naaman, then be the catalyst. Act as a catalyst. Pray for that catalytic moment that God would work and just push the person, nudge the person over that barrier so that the person can believe and become saved. Isn't, isn't that exciting if you think about that? You can be that agent of God. And that's basically evangelism, to preach the gospel, to tell them the good news. Let's keep reading just a little more and see what happens after that. Now, uh, in verse 15, so when Naaman was healed, he returned to the man of God, obviously, you know, you want to come back to the man who told you, and he says, he and all his A's, all the servants came together. Now, they became all kind of believing now. And, came, and they came and stood before him. Now, this time, Elisha is not sending a messenger. He's standing face to face with Naaman and his servants, all, these, all his aides. And he said, Naaman, indeed now I know, not I thought, but now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Your God, the God of Israel, is the true God. So now therefore, please take a gift from your servant. It's all out of goodwill. But of course, in this um, case, Elisha refuses. Why? Because Elisha wants to make sure that healing was given as gift of God. Free gift. That's grace. So he makes sure that no one receives that. Now, if you keep reading the story, um, his servant Gehazi becomes greed and he goes after uh, Naaman and gets some clothes. And for that, he gets leprosy instead. So he gets punished and his life ends uh, in, a, in a miserable way. But anyway... Here, at, the, at least, um, he's offering some gifts. Elijah says, no, just go. It's okay. God is gracious and he gives healing for free, graciously. It's a gift of God. As the Lord lives before him, before whom I stand, I will receive nothing, he said. Now, Naaman urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said, okay, if that is what you say, if you insist, I understand, Please then at least let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, um, soil, so that I can take it and perhaps and he, was about, he was planning to make some sort of altar or spread out this soil, soil of Israel, so that he could worship the Lord God. That's a symbol of saying that I am going to worship your God, God of Israel. He has become my God. Like Ruth, your, fa your God has become my God. Your people, my people. In fact, this is very important for Israel, even historically, because from this time, Syria never invades Israel, at least uh, as long as Naaman was alive. I mean, how could he? I mean, he, he owes a lot to the nation Israel and the prophet, and this is a country, kingdom chosen by God, so he, he wouldn't do that. So he brings some kind of protection from Syria for some time by doing this miracle. So that's all God's providence as well. So Naaman says, let me take some soil. So he does that. So he worships God even in his home country. He just asks for one concession. Uh, well, you can interpret it in a number of different ways. Maybe because it was just um, um, new faith, that his faith was not strong enough. So that um, he's kind of asking for forgiveness. Just in case, if the king of Syria worships in his temple, the idol, and if he compels me to do it, I have to go with it because he's my king. I serve him, so please um, forgive me. So he kind of asked that little concession. Um, 
And then Elisha says in verse 19, then he said to him, go in peace, go in peace. Often Jesus, when he healed people and saved people, he said things like, go in peace, the same thing. It's an expression to say, yes, you have peace. It's like saying you're saved. You're in the kingdom of God. Naaman now has saving faith. And he worships God for the rest of his life. That's the story. Now, in this story, we've seen quite a lot of things already, isn't it? Um, we can see that um, you can start the process use wisdom and pray to God how you can say that. You can be the catalyst and pray for that catalytic moment and keep telling the person the stories of God. Be persuasive, convince, rebuke if you have to in a very respectful way and persuade the person to turn to the Lord God. Naaman's name also appears in the New Testament. Not in a very explicit way like um, Rahab. But nonetheless, Jesus gives an impression that Naaman is in heaven. He mentions Naaman in Luke chapter 4, verse 27, in a very favorable light. Naaman was the, the leper who was healed, and only he was healed in Syria, Jesus said in Luke chapter 4. So when you go to heaven, Go and talk to Naaman. When you go to heaven, you can go and talk to Rahab and ask some questions. You know, how, how, how could you make that decision to believe in, believe in the God of Israel? You can ask Naaman, what was it like to be healed? All kinds of things. What we can learn and apply in our lives that also you want to perhaps discuss during our table talk time is this. As I told you before, um, last week, a simple question. You go and talk to people and ask them, would you like to read the Bible with me? Whether they are Christians or non-Christians, you can ask the question, would you like to read the Bible with me? Whether they are your friends or family, or even strangers sometimes, work colleagues, would you like to read the Bible with me? You read a section, you retell the story with your own words. That helps you understand the story. And then you ask the person to retell the story to see if the person understood the Bible correctly. That's how you make the start. So start the process like the little girl. And keep telling them the story of God. And there will be a moment. There will be a moment when you believe that this could be the catalytic moment. And be the catalyst and start the reaction and the rest is history right let's pray heavenly father we thank you for this wonderfully encouraging story the story of naaman who was a noble man and yet a leper he was a picture of everyone who comes to this world as as a sinner no matter how successful and how prominent we become no matter how good our life may seem in this world we have that in underlying places in our hearts that unresolved issues with sin and death and judgment unbelievers do not know how to deal with those problems but we do through the gospel and as those with the truth we feel responsible to share this with others. It was given to us freely. We are to give this out to people freely. If we simply withhold this and not share with people, we also understand that that is a great sin. To know how to do good and not doing it is clearly sin according to the book of James, according to your word, Lord. And we are accountable for this, Lord. So we pray that no one in our congregation would be abdicating of this responsibility and privilege to share the good news with the people around us. And at every opportunity, may we share this news with people. We may be starting the process, 
but that's okay. Help us to start the process. But then again, we may be the catalyst to help the person to make that last step of faith. And we pray, Lord, that we can experience and, and witness those conversions a lot, a lot, Lord. So use us, train us, teach us your word, help us to know your story, the truth from the Bible more, so that we can go and tell them and even invite them to read the word of God together. We commit all these things to you, trusting that you will allow us to do this and guide us and lead us to do this well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.